But yes, hello, everybody, and welcome to session two of Getting Started with Splunk, the series. So today, we'll be going over the Splunk platform and architecture. Here we have a forward-looking statement. In a nutshell, this says that any statements that may be made by anyone on the Splunk team today that may be forward-looking regarding products or technology is only based on current expectations and is in fact subject to change. Yes, yeah, so my name is Sawyer Monticello. I will be leading today's presentation. I am a solutions engineer here at Splunk and I am based out of Arlington, Virginia. So about five minutes from Washington, DC. But since this is the second session out of five, I want to take a minute here to go over what each session will be about. So we begin the session, session one, with the importance of machine data. Then today we're going to discuss the Splunk platform and its architecture. Session three will be an introduction on Splunk's processing language. And during session four, we will go over knowledge objects. Finally, we will end our sessions with popular SPL commands and leave you with some valuable Splunk resources. So once again, during the last session, which was our first session, we discussed machine data and how important it is for organizations to have a solution like Splunk in place to have full visibility. But today we are going to discuss the Splunk platform itself the differences between Splunk Enterprise and Splunk Cloud, how we can extend the core platform, the architecture of the core platform, and the Splunk search interface. So a pretty packed schedule for session two. So we previously discussed the importance of having a solution in place that would provide full visibility into all of our systems. So let's now take a better look into how Splunk does this with our unified security and observability platform. Splunk gives you end-to-end -end visibility across all your data. This means no more data sampling or blind spots. Our platform enables you to see across any data source at any scale in real time. We do this with our unified security and observability platform model. Our goal is to unify security and observability so you can make your organization more digitally resilient. But you need more than complete visibility. You need to be able to act quickly on threats, performance issues, or any other obstacles with human support or increasingly artificial intelligence. The good news is that with Splunk, the same platform that keeps your system secure and resilient can be extended to solve for a variety of custom use cases. We offer best-in-class tools and automation engines that are purpose-built to accelerate the detect, investigate, and response cycle for incident management, so you can respond to incidents quickly at scale, whether that's a security incident, an observability incident, or anything with elements of both. Our unified security and observability platform can help you address it. Our industry-leading security solution bring together all the key abilities security practitioners need to drive faster detection and investigation. It also enables a more coordinated response, thereby increasing SOC efficiency. So you can ensure that you remain compliant with your company's policies and reduce business risk. We also have our industry-leading observability platform that brings together all the key capabilities IT ops and engineering teams need in an integrated package. So you can keep eyes on your applications, your services, and your infrastructure, and ensure that your systems remain reliable and deliver exceptional customer experiences. We also provide a growing number of offerings powered by Splunk AI. These are not standalone, but an integrated part of our application and platform experience to help power faster, more advanced detections, and to help you complete your investigations faster with less effort. But of course, as technology transitions from on-premise to the cloud, 
Splunk's focus is to ensure our customers are able to focus more on gaining business critical insights and less on managing backend technologies. Splunk Cloud removes a lot of this burden by providing Splunk as a service, including adherence to rigorous security standards and best in class service delivery, such as 100% uptime guarantee, resilient infrastructure, and 24 seven knock and sock support teams, all while providing the fastest time to value for our customers and the lowest total cost ownership for running Splunk. Along with our comprehensive set of data collection methods, customers can rest knowing their critical data is centralized and accessible during an unexpected incident. Adding to the benefits of our core platform, our community of Splunkers and platforms has built over 3,100 apps available on Splunkbase that allow users to extend and customize their environments, supporting even more use cases than what is available out of the box. So Splunkbase is just our marketplace, it's our app store. You can access the vast library of applications built by Splunkers and partners or build and customize your own with the platform API, SDKs, and more, so you can run your systems and support your services in the way that works best for you. Now, before I go to Splunkbase, it's important to note that there are two different offerings on the website. There are apps and there are add-ons. An app has dashboards, visualizations, and maybe some embedded workflows. Add-ons, on the other hand, are great for getting data into Splunk. When getting data into Splunk, we are telling Splunk the type of file structure that we are expecting. Splunk's bread and butter is its schema on read capability. This is when we are able to skip the steps of extract, transform, and instead the structure and schema of our data is created when queries against the data are executed. This is what many people at Splunk call schema on the fly. The add-ons in Splunk base illustrate a great example of this. So as you are looking in your own data environment and thinking about data sources that you're working with, I would urge you to take a look at Splunkbase. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at Splunkbase. So right now we are at the landing page of Splunkbase and I'm going to go ahead and click the apps icon here at the top left. Here we can see if an app is supported by the Splunk support team or the app developers right here at the bottom. For example, if we look at the Splunk dashboard example app, we can see that it is in fact supported by Splunk. And if we click on the app, we can get some more information about it. For example, we have this summary tab right here. And we can also see a few screenshots of some of the content that the app comes with. So that was a quick overview on Splunk base. So next I will briefly go over Splunk's architecture and how we were able to get data into the platform. So we can break this down into three main components that make up this pyramid like structure. There are forwarders, indexers, and a search head. So at the bottom here, we can see a wide variety of common sources that Splunk collects data from. We are not limited to these at all. Our platform can take in any data source that is text-based and human readable. Next is the most common way to send data into Splunk, which is through a universal forwarder. The universal forwarder, which I'll call the UF, is installed on each machine where you need to monitor files and directories. In the UF's configuration, you specify which data sources to monitor. The UF then will continuously monitor the configured data source. And when new data is created or changes occur in the specified file, it reads and forwards that data to the designated Splunk indexer, which is our next level of the pyramid. The indexer then parses, indexes, and stores the data in a format that makes it searchable within Splunk. Once indexed, the data is stored in the indexer's index file system where users can then use Splunk's search ed, which is the final level of the pyramid, to search, analyze, and visualize 
the data using Splunk's search and reporting capability. It is also important to note that the UF is not the only way to get data into the platform. There are several methods for ingesting data into Splunk, including, but not limited to using add-ons, APIs, and even configuring Splunk to listen on a port. As you can see here in the diagram, the Splunk search head, which is our top of the pyramid, and the Splunk indexers are in different colors than everything else in this pyramid. This is because they represent the different shared responsibility with Splunk Cloud versus Splunk Enterprise, which is our on-prem solution. In Splunk Cloud, you outsource the management of your indexers and search head to Splunk, while within Splunk Enterprise, you are responsible for installing, configuring, and maintaining the system on which they both run. All right, now that we understand the platform, platform and how it's set up a bit better, let's take a closer look at the search interface. You'll notice a few different components on the slide, but something that we should be aware of is time, which you can see the time range picker in the top right. So first and foremost, we want to make Splunk efficient. So how do we search efficiently inside of the environment? And the very first thing we can do is shorten our time window. We are also given a histogram. If you think about this in a production environment, let's say you had an issue and you knew it happened yesterday at around five o'clock. You could change your time range to yesterday between maybe 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. And then if you saw spikes in the histogram, you could hone in on those specific logs by filtering those events in that time range and histogram. We also have our search bar. This is where we tell Splunk which events to bring back. So we ran the search of action equals purchase, status equals 200. This brings us back all of the raw events for purchase events with a status code of 200. To the left of the events, we have a timestamp associated with each event. The other thing that it's important to note is on the left-hand side, we have selected fields at the top, which by default is going to be host, source, and source type. And then we have interesting fields. Interesting fields mean that in my search results, at least 25% of the events returned had these fields as part of them. This goes back to the idea of schema on the fly with this instant structure Splunk has provided us. So that's all we have for session two. I hope you took something away from that. But once again, thank you all for coming to session two and we hope to see you at session three where we're going to talk about Splunk SPL. It's a really cool session happening there.